I want to thank our sponsor, Planet Ford. Planet Ford has always been a proud supporter of law enforcement in the community, providing customer service and fleet management, sales and service. If you're looking for that personal quality service, contact Planet Ford in spring or online at planetford.com. You're listening to Crime Scene Today, where we talk about future and current issues affecting law enforcement, forensic, and crime scene investigation. I'm your host, Dan Zintek. If you missed uh, last episode with Tyler Dunham, uh, we covered a lot of things in human trafficking. He came here from Uganda, where he is uh, working over there. We talked about everything under the sun, including uh, sacrificing children in Uganda. So uh, problems that we don't have here, that obviously he's doing a great job over there and and a good friend and prosecutor, past prosecutor from Montgomery County. Uh, Updates on some upcoming conferences. Uh, It's... So the ACER conference, the uh, Association Crime Scene Reconstruction, is holding their conference March 2nd through the 4th in Oklahoma. It's going to be a hybrid conference. Uh, We're going to be there. We're going to be interviewing uh, some of the superstars in crime scene, some of the original people uh, dealing with blood stain and shooting reconstruction and some of the technologies that are uh, being challenged and some that are uh, coming about. So that'll be a, a great time there. If uh, you want more information on that, it's acsr.org. Also for the IEI conference, which is the International Association for Identification, it's going to be in August in Nashville. Uh, Presentations are open. If there's some knowledge that you want to share, if there's something that you're working on, uh, they'd love to hear from you. The presentations are due by March 5th. Uh, Just go to theiai.org and submit those, and we hope that uh, you make the conference. So today uh, in the studio, uh, we have Nancy Airbear, excuse me, Airbear and Wesley LaRue. Yes. Uh, so they are prosecutors with Montgomery County DA's office and uh, brought them here because they had uh, worked an interesting case that just cleared out so we can talk a little bit about it. Uh, and, uh, and we're going to get to that in a little bit as far as what we're going to talk about is is the prosecution they had to deal with in prosecuting a former priest in the Catholic Church. Um, but I've known Nancy Abair for a long time in, in working child crimes, and I know that those in and of themselves are, are challenging. We've had Victoria Constance in talking about Safe Harbor. Uh, so, uh, Nancy, if you could just sort of explain a little bit of some of the challenges in general, and Wesley certainly join in on anything uh, that uh, uh, you want to add, and some of the challenges in just taking on child crimes. Obviously, these victims are so young to have a voice and, and are not able to articulate things as, as much as adults and be as much of a part of it as adults. That, that's exactly right, and that's why um, Children's Safe Harbor was created in a multidiscipline team approach. Um, Basically, it takes all the different agencies, as Victoria Constance probably uh, told you all about, that uh, someone that's been involved in child abuse would come into contact with, law enforcement, CPS, um, the need for counselors, which are provided free of service because Children's Safe Harbor is a nonprofit agency. Um, And they have specially trained forensic interviewers that are uh, trained to talk to children because it's very, like you indicated, it is not common for children to want to talk about sexual abuse. Um, There is usually, in fact, a delay. So the multidiscipline team approach, um, where all the agencies are on one campus, make it very easy for the families, for the children to be able to access all the different services that they need. But it also is the only crime that has this approach. And the reason for that is because of what you alluded to, the difficulties in prosecuting these type of crimes involving children. Children don't want to talk about uh, personal intimate matters of sexual relations and what happened to them. A lot of them don't even understand. Right. They shouldn't know those those answers at that time. Yeah. And then the older ones, um, even though at at school they may talk a lot freely or uh, very freely with their friends about sex, that is not something they want to discuss in front of a room full of strangers. So we usually come across um, a big delay in the outcry. So that's not un- uncommon in these kind of cases. You know, in, in the case that we're going to be talking about, y'all had that delay in outcry. And if if y'all could sort of explain, because there is a difference in statute of limitations from, I don't want to call them normal crimes, but uh, for th- these specific crimes involving children, there's an extension that's allowed by the law. There, there is. There's a statute of limitations, like you said, that says after a certain amount of period, 
um, the child, regardless of uh, the fact that they want to now prosecute, is no longer able to prosecute. And so um, the statute of limitations back when this would have happened in the 1996 and 2001 time frame would have been uh, 10 years plus 18. Uh, I'm sorry, 10 plus 18 plus 10. So right. when they reach their 18th birthday, then the statute of limitations was 10 years. So by the time someone is 28 years old, um, they would no longer be allowed to prosecute. But the statute did change. And when it changed, it would grandfather in and so what you had was a statute that was originally 10 years, then it changed to 18 plus 10, and then eventually changed to no statute of limitations at all. And so um, there is a, a big gap in the amount of whether or not something can be prosecuted or not that has to be looked into. And we'll talk about in a minute um, how we found out about this particular case and the math that was involved in trying to determine whether or not we could prosecute. But I know um, another part or uh, difficulty with these kind of cases is um, people under the misunderstanding about uh, where the danger is. Right. And, you know, these cases are different in their investigation, and that's why we have the MDT approach, because with the delayed outcry, it's not like you see on television where these cases are always solved by DNA or, you know, what people would consider their physical evidence. Because right. of that delay, you rely heavily on um, the different, you know, statements that you get, and it's very witness intensive for these cases. Sort of the the back history and looking into the behaviors that was going on then, what's surrounding it. I mean, obviously, we don't have DNA ten years later. We don't have bite marks alive. All the, all the many things that we may get in other crimes. Right, and and like you talked about in your introduction here. Um, you know, the type of perpetrator that you're looking at is important. Growing up, we heard a lot of, of talk about stranger danger, but the reality is that, that well more than 90% of the perpetrators who molest children are either family members or people who are in positions of trust and authority over them, such as in this case being a priest or being a coach or teacher. Um, people who... Right, they're not the strangers that we warned them about. Right? Exactly. These are the people that should be caring for our children, and our, our children should be able to trust, but they're abusing that trust. And I think you made a point then, and certainly want to cover as far as me. We're going to be talking about uh, challenges in, in prosecuting a priest, you know, involved in, in the Catholic Church or just in the church in general. And it's something to certainly uh, bring forward is that when we talk about teachers, and we talk about coaches, and we talk about priests, religious people, Boy Scout leaders, these type of things, um, they're a small percentage. It, even though the jokes are out there, right? We, we joke about uh, the pedophiles being priests, the pedophiles being Boy Scout leaders. These, it's a street, extremely small percentage, and normally it's the fact that they seeked that position for this purpose, to find children, to get around children, and that type of thing. But as a whole, um, the the Catholic Church, the Boy Scouts, the the teachers that are out there, are there to do what those organizations were intended for. Right. You have to remove the institution from the individual perpetrator and keep your focus on that person and not prosecuting an organization as a whole. Right. It uh, so to sort of start out um, with this case. I mean, uh, obviously. You know, how did it come about? I mean, who, who originally got this information? What, uh, what brought it to law enforcement's attention? So we had a, um, uh, it was. It was a walk-in. Yeah, it was a walk-in, basically. Uh, the, one of the victims walked in and wanted to file a report. Okay. And it was with Conroe Police Department. And uh, so they walked in, they wanted to file a, a report, and they start talking about a crime that happened over 20 years ago. Right. And the immediate reaction uh, was that there's nothing there. I'm sorry, it's too late. Sure. Um, but that patrol person, um, d at least they took the time to say, well, you know what? I know the statute of limitations may be changed. You know, I know this was a long time ago. Let me check with the DA's office. And so I got a call. And the call was, um, look, this happened back in long early, time ago, yeah, right? long, long time ago. Is there anything we can do on anything this? Anything we can do, or is this just something I need to just take the report and move on? Right. And I said, no, take the report, get it to the detective. It ended up with Detective Joe McGrew, 
-hmm. get it to him because I worked with him. We were all, you know, in the same building at at Safe Harbor. And uh, he'll bring it to me, and we'll talk about it, and we'll do the math, and we'll see if we can make it work. Right. And so we got the facts from uh, McGrew got the facts, and we went through the different math elements of when the last time something happened, the date of birth, and on the type of offense, went through the statutes to see when they had changed, and determined, yes, indeed, it can still be prosecuted. And so that's why it's so important for, um, for the law enforcement patrol officer that actually called in and, and inquired and didn't just write it off. Well, and you bring up two points, and I know that we deal with it a lot more in cold case, but when the crime occurs, you're having to go back to what laws were in effect at the time that that happened. It's not that we can use today's laws for whatever happened back then, unless there's something that that retroacts or whatever. Right, and that's exactly right, and that's what this statute does have, is it has the ability to be retroactive and to pull someone in, and it's a whole math process. I mean, like, you should see the board I have to do. (laughs) Um, it's, it's, it's like I very, I get a calculator and everything. I want to make sure I do it right. Like and I have the statute. Like algebra involved and stuff? Are those <laughs> yeah, things that you said you'd never use, now you're using? Right. All that <laughs> stuff that I complained of in eighth grade. Yeah. And so it, it was, you know, you want to make sure you do it right before you say, yes, we can do this, you know, and, and get everybody's hopes up. You want to make sure you've done it right. You know, but there's a great importance in that, and that is very rarely when we find a, a trusted individual whether it's a coach, a teacher, a priest, whatever it may be, that it's only one victim, right? right. It's so rare that it's just that one time, right, that we, and usually it's a, it's a common thing in law enforcement that we're putting out, and we don't know. I mean, it's, it's literally throwing a net out going, here's the guy, this this is who we're looking at. He's been involved in, um, in coaching. He's been involved in teaching. He's been involved in this in these areas. If there's anybody out there, please come forward, right? I mean, and... So even if someone comes in and says this occurred 20 years ago, we still really want to know who this is because if they're still available, you know, and making themselves uh, available around children. Absolutely, because even, like you said, if we can't prosecute that one case, uh, law enforcement now, they're, the person is in their radar, and we right. can look at where they are now. Are they still around children um, and, and maybe find out whether or not they have any um, other access. And, and that's actually what happened in this case is after we made the arrest of La Rosa, we had additional victims come forward. And so that's a perfect example of what happened here is, you know, we found that throughout his life as a priest, uh, he had access to children. And we started hearing a lot of stories about other pe- people who were either victims or who were concerned about behavior they saw about him. So now, uh, and, and obviously, I mean, not to get too far ahead of things that y'all found, I mean, uh, were there things, and, and I know we talked a little bit before the show, were there things that he was involved in prior to being a priest that would have involved children, that would have had him around, or was that sort of the first thing y'all found was that? So the, the first thing that we kind of discovered was that during seminary, uh, when he was Before he was ordained as a priest, when he was trying to get ordained, um, it was notated in a lot of records that uh, he liked the youth groups, that he would not do his other responsibilities because he preferred to be hanging around the youth groups and be with them. And so that was one of the first red flags that we did see um, looking back that he did have that propensity to be around the youth um, a majority of the time. So... Uh, this person's come in, and we found out, yep, we can move forward. Yeah. What's next? Well, and actually, two days later, an, another victim came in, did not know about they the first— They didn't know each other? Did not know each other. That was our first thing, right? Did these people know the, each other? Right. But it just so happened that one of the victims had um, heard something in the news uh, okay. that had been about—they um, saw the um, basically the archdiocese— uh, what was he, the, the Cardinal DiNardo, Cardinal DiNardo yeah. heard something on him, with him on the TV or something like that and was upset that they didn't feel like he had handled their case appropriately. Um, so they came forward, and they did not know the other victims. So the very first question we had is, do these two victims even sure. know each other? Yeah, it was so close together, certainly. And they did not. And then so we began, uh, once we found out they did not know each other, we realized that both of them could still prosecute 
Uh, then we started do developing a, a strategy, like a game plan, like how are we going to find out about uh, what happened 20 years ago? Right, that's a long time, and obviously parishioners change, and um, it was, uh, he had changed, uh, obviously, he was, these, these occurred here in Montgomery County, if I'm correct, and yes. then, um, but he had since moved, and obviously you have parishioners that move. I mean, how do you go back to locating people that went to a church 20 years ago? Well, we we <laughs> you know? we uh, we talked to the the victims, and of course they were kids at the time, and so their memories were not um, you know very specific. Right. But uh, we basically just recreated the the idea of what would have happened back then, and then we kind of decided, well, we would do grand jury subpoenas to try and gather some information. Um, and then we decided on search warrants. So, I mean, that's, so to explain a little bit of the steps, I mean, uh, <clears throat> normally grand jury, we go to a lot of businesses and it's not out of lack of cooperation from any businesses. They're just like, Hey, we'd like court process. Right. Um, but normally a grand jury subpoena works. Normally if we give them that, that's all we need. They'll provide whatever records they sort of feel like they have their, their basis covered. Right. Uh, but I would assume, uh, that, going from that to a search warrant was a lack of cooperation in, in getting things? So, um, you know, in this case, we did. We issued a lot of grand jury subpoenas to try to gather documents. Sure. And there were a ton of documents in this case. As soon as this case was filed, obviously uh, the Catholic Church um, hired their own attorneys to represent the church's interest of the archdiocese. And they did provide uh, documents in response to our subpoena, but we could tell that it it wasn't everything that we believed was out there. They decided what they wanted you to have, not everything that if we didn't, requested. If we didn't ask it in the, the way that they wanted us to ask it, they weren't going to give it to us. And so at that point in time, we decided that we didn't want to rely on their discretion and what they were providing to us. And so we executed a search warrant, which we do in a lot of cases. Sure, um, right. That is a very common practice for us to go in and execute a search warrant just so that for our comfort level, we know we have everything that exists. And that's what we ended up doing here. Uh, as soon as this case was filed, the day that La Rosa was arrested, uh, we started executing our strategy of a series of search warrants in this case. And those were served, I mean, it wasn't just the local church here. I mean, y'all were at the diocese, which is a in Houston, obviously the fourth largest city in the nation. That's a big deal. I it, mean, it was a big building. It's, it's a <laughs> lot of records, a lot of things. I mean, um, uh, obviously, I mean, I've run search warrants with y'all. I mean, you obviously don't go in and try to search this whole building for what you have. I mean, was it, was well, it that? Well, no, we, we were very lucky that we had a huge group of people helping us. Everyone from, uh, federal agencies, to the Texas Rangers, CPD. Um, I think most of the DA's office was there. We gave instructions on what we were looking for, and we had a lot of help because it was a big undertaking. Right, Wes? Absolutely. Um, and, and that was the last search warrant that we ran. You know, we started with uh, the church where he was at the time of his arrest, which was St. John Fisher down in Richmond. Yeah. Then we executed a search warrant here um, at Sacred Heart where he was uh, back at the time where the incidents happened. Um, and then we went on, we discovered that he had served some time at a, a facility called the Shalom Center. I had seen some about it, so, and obviously all, all I know about it is just whatever, I, that I guess like if, if a, and please uh, educate me on it, if a priest gets accused uh, of this or there's something, some issue that they would send them there for some treatment or something, uh, I'm thinking you send them to the <laughs> jail for some treatment, but uh, I, I'm just... Yes. So explain the, the Shalom Center or yes. whatever. It's over in East County. I, yeah, that I knew. That, I've, yeah. I've, that was so. a surprise to us to learn that we actually that had here. <laughs> that yeah. treatment facility here in our county. I hope it's not because it's more needed here. <laughs> <laughs> they come from all over. Yes, they do. They, they take priests from all over the country. But um, So what's its purpose? It, so it, it's not just for what the church terms as boundary violations or sexual abuse allegations. It's for anything. If a um, dependency issues that a priest may have, or if a priest hits burnout and they just need time or counseling or therapy for a variety of reasons, they go there. Okay. And so what happened in this case, one of the very fortunate things that, that we had in this case is that one of our victims 
did come forward and report the abuse to the church uh, back in 2001. And when they did that, uh, that is when the church, they removed him from service, they sent him to the Shalom Center. Now, is that still, was that one of the victims from this case? Yes. yes. Okay, all right. Yeah, the, the, one of the people that came into CPD and reported it was the one So they that made re- them aware in 2001. In 2001, but... Yes, and so they sent him to the Shalom Center, and then they had him basically just write a desk at the Archdiocese for a couple of years. They had a couple of internal reviews uh, that they do. It's a pretty formal process within the Archdiocese, and then they released him back into service as the head priest over at St. John Fisher. I mean, it. I guess and it's probably just from working these crimes for so long. I mean, I, I don't personally believe of a cure for pedophilia. I, I as far as going to counselor, I, you know, and, and my belief on that is just based on from the cases I've worked, it appears to be a sexual preference. They have a sexual preference for an age and these type of things that doesn't really change or go away. I don't, uh, and so it's, it's concerning, I guess, that you, know, you, you send for, whether it's the Shalom Center or we send somebody to counseling or whatever, that somehow we believe that's gonna cure from future things. I don't think cure is what they're, they're hoping for. I think they're hoping to uh, re-educate, look for triggers, and when you see the trigger, to back off or remove yourself, kind of um, remove yourself from that temptation, basically, is what I think their end goal is when they're trying to do this type of rehabilitation. Yeah, no, I would believe that. I just don't think you should have to teach someone not to be sexually attracted to a child, but then that's just a different flow of thought. So, <laughs> well, I think uh, most of the I think most of the studies and and statistics out there would would support what you're saying that it's it's not necessary. It's not going to be a cure. Yep. And of course, us in law enforcement think jail is a better place. Right. I mean, it's, you know. It uh, does remove temptation. It, it does. So, well, <laughs> yes. For children. <laughs> For children, yes. Uh, but, sorry, Wes. So, back to sort of what, what uh, you were discussing. I mean, so he's received treatment, and then, as you say, he's riding a desk for a while. I mean, was there something that was, I guess, documentation on how long he was to do this? What's the, I guess you're okay, you can go back to, to priest? or what yes and and that's what one of the things that we were fortunate for is that you know the archdiocese and the catholic church keeps records on pretty much everything pretty much every email that they get they keep and they have records of and that's what we were able to find during our search warrant and so as we were going through all of these records uh, we discovered the exact timeline that he was there at the shalom center his postings and even his follow-up aftercare that he went to so all of that was documented. And we, we were lucky, too, because we recovered notes from their meeting with our victim back in 2001. Um, we recovered emails related to our victims when they made the reportings. Um, so we were able to recover all of those documents as well. So during that search, obviously, we're talking a lot about the 2001 case, but did y'all find other things, I guess, from there? I mean, obviously, he had still been practicing, and, and you said he was in... Uh, I can't remember uh, what church was he in. St. John, John Fisher. Uh, no, what city when he was Richmond. arrested? Richmond. He was in Richmond when he was arrested. So obviously there's there's still the availability. I mean, did y'all find something beyond the 2001? Yes. So we were ultimately able to identify and confirm at least four child victims of his. And obviously one of them came forward in 2001, and then that's one of the ones who made the CPD report. Right. And the other, the second one who made a CPD report had gone to the church first before uh, they went to law enforcement. And so in the months leading up to uh, them filing the CPD report, they were in communications with the church because they were at a time in their life where they wanted uh, the church to provide counseling for them. And um, they wanted to, they had left the Catholic church and they wanted to get back in with the church. And so we found a lot of documentation of conversations that happened uh, with him in the months leading up to the arrest. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, you bring up a point as far as the, and we already talked about earlier, the difference between the entity of the church and the, and the prayer, but the problem is so many times those cannot be separated by the victim, meaning that how it hurts them later in life is, you know, they're, they're not doing normal things such as going to church and enjoying those things with other people. Mm-hmm. And when other people speak of those things, it's, it's attached to this. 
Right. Yeah, and that's the, that's the biggest problem with these kind of child cases anyway. I mean, you've got that abuse of trust, that loss of trust between a child, a parent, a child, an uncle, um, a child, a coach, or a teacher. But then you add on the element of a, a religious figure, somebody that they look up to, um, and that is just an extra component that um, really affects their faith. And so it's really a dramatic event for them in their, their upbringing of their own children um, and in their daily lives that they struggle with as they get older. Well, I mean, I mean pretty much it doesn't matter what religion that you have. Uh, usually a general foundation of most is right from wrong, right? right. And so that, that's sort of this foundation that that person's supposed to educate me, know the right from wrong, give me guidance and advice, and this is what's occurring. Right? And that was something that was very personal in our meetings with the victims. As we were sitting down with them, you could see the effect that this had on them because at the time, they were all very, very active within their church. They, A couple of them wanted to be priests themselves, and um, all of them were very close to LaRosa. LaRosa groomed them um, and was a very important figure in their life. And when he violated that trust, uh, they had a crisis of faith. Yeah, it's, it, um, it's one of those things where, like I said, we've talked about different types of offenders, but I think that's one that... Uh, I think that's one of the reasons why it is so publicized, uh, besides it being attached to such a large entity, but is the uh, impact and the effect it has for so long and in different ways than others do. But um, so, obviously, y'all ended up with a plea, but I know, because uh, I've known y'all a while, y'all had a plan for trial. Oh, we had a plan for trial. <laughs> so y'all, y'all had uh, things that you had to consider, and, and certainly, you know, one of the purposes uh, in this show besides just educating the the public is you know for law enforcement for prosecutors for people that are out there uh, to learn from subject matter experts that have been through it right uh, so uh, I guess sort of advice and things of, of things that you thought about through around and, and other things to, to get to there well we did develop a trial strategy and basically one of the things the key components is that to we were going to plan and, and this would be my advice to people that are prosecuting these cases would be that you've got to keep the focus on the perpetrator because your audience, your jury, um, if you're attacking the church, sure. then you then that's something that's personal. not it. That's not on trial. That's right. personal. And so we wanted to make sure when the the witnesses we chose um, in the uh, presentation of our evidence and our arguments that we were very careful to keep the focus on the bad guy. In this case, La Rosa. And so we were we. Um, we made sure that when we were developing our trial strategy that we kept the focus on him. So, I mean, we always had a question after working many cases um, of, you know, the hindsight, right, is what would y'all have liked to have had? Uh, is there something else that, I mean, not so much of something I want to do or not, whatever, but, I mean, if if in hindsight I wish I would have maybe done in this order, that order, um, you know, something that, that sticks with you that, you know, we always have that that moment, I guess. I guess it'd probably be the amount of documents that we had to review <laughs> a little bit better organization schedule. But luckily, we came up. Darla Faulkner was uh, somebody that stepped in and developed um, because we had so much documentation that we recovered um, that we were trying to focus on our La Rosa case. Right. But there were all these other possible uh, documents that indicated that there might be other. Uh, offenders out there. So how did y'all handle all that? Well, so Darla <laughs> developed a strategy where um, if it, she divided it amongst teams and sh she moved all the La Rosa stuff to us and all the other stuff went to other people to review and then it went over to the Attorney General. Yeah, that was one thing that um, made the documents and records in this case kind of skyrocketed numbers because as we were going through the Archdiocese, obviously we're looking for things pertinent to La Rosa Right. But if we encounter another um, crime, another crime, right. and we don't know if law enforcement's been Knows involved, about it, right. so that's what we did. And, and Darla Faulkner's team did a great job in creating a spreadsheet to present to the AG's office, so that Nancy and I could build our trial team. And, and that's what I'll say. Brett Ligon, the DA, um, really gave us a, a great opportunity to have a great team focused on this case. And 
we locked ourselves in a conference room <laughs> for about two months mm -hmm. uh, focused on nothing but developing our trial strategy. And that's where all the office stepped up, right? Because with all the office uh, allowing us to, to handle this one case and focus on it, yeah, y'all had other things that y'all normally would have been doing. Our office gave us a lot of support, so we were we're very grateful for that. You know, and, and I've seen that time and time again uh, with uh, <laughs> DA Ligon and, and Montgomery County. With if there's something that needs to be addressed, uh, everything's put on it, right? You know, and and not to the fault that other things will fall. You know, you other people step up and do it, right? Right. You know, but uh, those are certainly challenges with these with these cases. Um, so I mean going forward because it seems to be and just your thoughts on it it's it seems and i'm hoping that in the past couple of years I maybe mean, we've had numerous uh conversations uh with you know sexual assaults of me too movement of of different things with children and whatnot um it seems as though i don't really want to say not a priority but it just appears like i said as soon as you contact the catholic church there's there's lawyers involved, and I understand they have things to protect on their end too. But you know, is it being addressed? You know, do we see a change that we want to take care of this? Right? I mean, uh, you know what I'm saying? It's yeah, I, I think um, I think I saw uh, they made efforts to work with us, the attorneys that we worked with from the archdiocese. Um, I hope the tone that I hear from the Pope. Um, hopefully is changing. I know they prosecuted a case in Florida um, and some other locations where they were um, hopefully holding people accountable. And every time we hold a priest accountable, I think eventually the church is going to see that people are going to turn away. People are going to are not going to want to uh, support an institution. We had more than one person tell us, I still believe uh, in my faith, but I just can't go to church. And when they, I think when the church starts to realize or when they heard that, I'm hopeful that they are starting to make a change. And, and I will say, I think the, the church's response to a, a kid coming to them today is going to be a lot different than what happened with our victim back in 2001. Oh, certainly. I, I think there's, uh, I think certainly as society has changed, there's more belief um, where uh, sadly, just many years ago, and I shouldn't say many, just uh, not that long ago, um, you believed the priest, you believed the teacher, you, uh, they not only were in a, a high role for that student or whoever, but uh, as, you know, they believed them over a kid making an accusation. And I think, um, I certainly don't think it's changed where, oh, we just believe the kid, but I think it has at least opened the door that we need to look into this. Yeah, right. we just need to listen and we need to investigate, right? Because just because a kid comes forward doesn't make it true, but just because a kid comes forward doesn't make it not true. Right. So it's got to be investigated. And I think giving um, everyone a fair shake to listen to what actually happened and also understanding. I think um, there's also been a shift and a change in understanding how to prosecute these cases, how to investigate them from law enforcement standpoint. I know law enforcement um, has invested... There's several different law enforcement agencies over at Safe Harbor. There's Precinct 3. Mm -hmm. um, there is uh, the uh, SO, Sheriff's Office, CPD. And the reason for them all being there is a recognition that these cases take a certain amount of time, obviously, to investigate them properly, but also to understand that the children aren't going to just come running forward and tell everything that happened. Well, and I think that that's another part that uh, we certainly have had in training over the past years is uh, in the past, you had patrol officers that tried interviewing these kids, yeah. right? <laughs> that, I mean, we didn't do forensic interviews. It was, you know, you had a um, patrol officer of all, all shapes and size and gruff or, or gentle personalities or whatever uh, asking this child what happened to them, right? Um, luckily, like I said, over the past years, we've educated the patrol officer on how to how to still document but not have that interview and get them uh, over to, for a forensic interview, which is designed to be a lot different than just interviewing on the streets, right? Yeah. Uh, I, I think that's made a change. I think that that uh, hopefully has brought some awareness to that. And um, we're lucky enough here to have Safe Harbor and multiple. Sorry, I don't know what other agencies do. I mean, I know there's many around the country, but 
the yeah. rural areas certainly don't have this. Well, they have access to an MDT program. There's 60, I think there's 66 now in, in Texas, uh, different um, uh, CACs, Children Advocacy Centers, all over the state of Texas. Um, but many of them in the rural areas, they do have to support multiple counties, and they don't have everyone on site. So they miss that, um, the component of just having your detective right across the hall or uh, down in another building right over there, a CPS, and you can uh, go and, and make sure that this child is safe and all work together. And that's a huge component in keeping these cases moving forward. So now a question sort of related to y'all is you had someone coming forward that's now an adult. So as an adult, do you interview them as an adult or do they still head to the forensic interview? As, the interview is an adult. So they they're not going through the other process that's right. They didn't. Right. They don't go through the safe harbor. Does the two through seventeen right. year olds? So um, they came. They were much, they were much older than that when they came through. So they were interviewed by um, CPD. And if I could follow up on one thing that sure. Nancy just said, um, it's specific for law enforcement here in Montgomery County. Even if you're not one of those agencies that's located at Safe Harbor, for any agency in Montgomery County, if you're working a child sexual abuse case, call me. Um, I'm available to you to answer questions, to help you out with your investigation. Um, so we're not just helping out the detectives who are there at Safe Harbor. I'm available to y'all as a resource uh, anytime. Yeah, and that was the beauty. I mean, we would have different agencies from all over call us and ask questions. Um, and we want to be available to them to answer those questions because we want to make sure that the cases are prosecuted in the best possible practices, using the best possible practices that there are. Um, and we would love <clears throat> all the agencies to be right. housed at Safe Harbor. And uh, they we, are we would like that big of a building, and we're they, working on it. They are but, working uh, on the big building, and so um, the more the merrier, uh, except one day we would like to be put out of business. That would be right. cool, too. Yeah, I don't see that happening. I, <laughs> I, I, I sort of go back to my original thing, but, uh, right. yeah, I, we're not going out of business anytime soon. Uh, but, the uh, yeah, Safe Harbor has, has been great for the community and, and the people going there, and and all provide. The other thing that it brings is the education from just like y'all in doing this. If someone were to have another case that involved the Catholic Church, then by all means, y'all are now the experts in this area of having gone through that process of at least knowing what you're about to face or what you may have to do. You know, I remember us using a very similar with, uh, uh, we had our like national case with uh, the kidnapping and murder of the uh, mother and whatever um, and we knew that most likely they were going to be claiming some type of mental illness this that and other and Ligon had called down to Harris County on what defenses were used uh, in in those cases down there in a, in a national case down there so we already knew when we brought them in the interview room this is this is what we're we're dealing with right um, and speaking of, so I mean, did LaRosa ever talk to y'all? He just, he lawyer up, never said a word. Yeah, no, there was no interview. Yeah. And, and if, if somebody, if you are going to prosecute a case involving a Catholic priest, please reach out to us because uh, that's what we did. When we first got the case, neither Nancy or I are Catholic. And so in, in order to understand a lot of what was taking place behind the scenes, sure. we had to learn about the church and the organizational structure and uh, their protocol for investigating these allegations. And so it was a huge learning curve for us. Yeah, I mean, there, there's um, obviously, as you said, you know, there's, there's an organizational ladder, there's people that are in charge more than others, there's, and by all means, what they say goes. And it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's certainly unlike, and as you say, you're taking on a whole different uh, type of environment versus we have so many like non-denominational churches out now, right? And it's just a, a pastor. They're usually a single entity of themselves, yes. right? Mm -hmm. And that is not the Catholic Church. I mean, obviously, you have the Pope all the way down, Vatican City and everything, you know, to... There's a, there's a hierarchy, yeah. yeah mm -hmm. that, um, that obviously, and it also expresses their interest, right? Meaning that uh, to try to protect from that false allegation, um, you know, maybe in the past may have been too strong 
uh, protecting it, thinking it was false, and not looking in. And as I said, uh, I, I do believe that that's changed more, um, and, and hopefully, as you said, more, more times than not that this happens, we hope that ideas change. And I, and I think you're right. I think one of the things that really makes that change is, well, the parishioners. I mean, that's no matter what your hierarchy is, uh, that's who you're serving. It's, it's just like us. We serve the public. You know, uh, our society, we are working for them, and, and it is them who tells us what's important in this area. And certainly in this area, it is child crimes. We've, you know, it always is about the children and stuff. Um, so what do you all think as far as, so Safe Harbor, we can grow Safe Harbor, what, uh, which, we, which we'd love to do. What other resources do you think would help, and, and not just in the priest or whatever, just in child crimes as far as helping with those things? Well, I mean, you've, all right, so obviously, like I said, Safe Harbor is a nonprofit, so um, there are as volunteer opportunities that they use. Um, when children come in and children have um, an interview, well, the children go back to the interview room with the forensic interviewer, um, and then they usually have a volunteer sit with the mom or the caregiver who's very upset, right, at having to be there. Um, and then the, the staff will need to talk to the mom or the detective will need to talk to the mom. Well, the volunteer will just sit and play with the children um, to keep them distracted so that the mom can go and talk to the detective or whomever they need to, CPS worker or whomever they need to. So volunteering would, is always an option. Um, they always accept donations. Victoria did not know I was going to say that. And then um, I didn't either. But then... Um, but I would think um, just constantly educating teachers, students, your own children, educating yourself, knowing um, that it's it, the person that's got, that is the perpetrator, just because they're nice to kids doesn't make them a pedophile, right? Right. Um, it's really all about what's in their heart. So um, I had an expert many times say this. Um, it, look, if I give my nephew... A, a, a toy right. it could be just me giving a nephew a toy that I love but if I'm giving that toy to the nephew in hopes of gaining access and trust so that I can abuse them then that's something different so I, I think it's just uh, learn being aware that when you do take your child to an environment such as being coached or to the church you know we want to trust these people but it's very important that we keep eyes on our children. Yeah, I, I can't tell you how many cases we've had where um, we, and certainly with so many busy schedules and anyone who has kids, you know that, uh, yes, you getting them there and being there and leave. I mean, it's it's hours out of your week if they want to participate. And it is. It's so much easier just to kick them out the car. I'll be back in an hour and I got things to do. And that's just not the best advice. I mean, if... Many of these perpetrators go off of the comfort that you'll do that, that you'll leave them alone, and that they can manipulate and uh, groom them. And But if you're there, they are way less likely to interact with your child. Yes, absolutely. It, um, and education, like Nancy said, is something that we're constantly doing and trying to do to educate not only law enforcement or teachers, but also the public in general about what child abuse is because a lot of people have misconceptions about it and so a lot of people don't understand a tentative disclosure or why a child might you know equivocate or test the waters when they first outcry and people will dismiss that not understanding that disclosure is a process so what should they be looking for on a kid, I guess, sort of attempting to talk to someone? What, what would that look like in a case you've seen? Well, I mean, obviously, the, a common example that we see of children coming forward is instead of saying, hey, he abused me, they say, I'm uncomfortable around your boyfriend, mom. You right. know, I, I don't like the way he hugs me. That's a child testing the waters to see how you are going to respond to that and see if it's they're in a safe place to say he's touching me inappropriately. Right. Yeah, I mean, they'll even say, um, he keeps touching me. And then the mom would say something like, oh, well, he's just playing. And then the child at that point feels dismissed, right? So, yeah, like, I can't tell you more. 
Yeah, it, like I can't trust mom to tell. And so it, it's looking for those type of phrases. Dig a little deeper to find out it's probably not just them messing, you know, with each other and teasing each other. There may be more behind it. There may be nothing, but you've got to find out. So what are common uh, changes in behavior that y'all have seen? It depends on the child. Some children, because um, it's an issue of control. So when something like that happens to them, they're kind of taken or lose some of the control over themselves. Uh, some children gain control back by trying to excel. So we will see grades go up. Our grades maintain the same. And then uh, because they're, that's something they can control. Right. But a lot of times what we'll see is obviously a, a child that moles on what happened to them. And then it's, they internalize it. So it really does depend on the child. Um, and when they internalize it, grades may start to drop. Um, they may start avoiding the perpetrator. Or that you may still see them run up and hug the perpetrator. Um, because they want to act like nothing's going on because they're too embarrassed for anyone to find out. So it, they're, unfortunately, it's really just too difficult. And that's one of the cri reasons why this crime is so hard to prosecute, why we all come together to try to work through these cases um, in an effort to give these children a voice. Yeah, I mean, the, the signs would be difficult because, I mean, it's many of the things you're describing – that's a teenager. Right. <laughs> okay. I mean, it's because they're just taking on normal things in school that they're upset about, or someone said something, or someone's not hanging out with me. Or, so there's this normal up and down roller coaster. I mean, that's also when they're going through all these changes in hormones and whatnot that, I mean, they're just moody to begin with and trying to pick out, is, are they moody because they're a normal teenager or is something actually going on with them? I would tell you that if your kid is wearing a hoodie in the summer, <laughs> yeah. Um, Make sure you see them without that hoodie on that would because be good, yeah. sometimes we find that the first time anybody's really looked at these kids without that hoodie on in the middle of the summer is when they go to have a medical exam after uh, an allegation, and then that's the first time we see cut marks. Right. And, and that's a way that they will deal with um, self-harm, will deal with what they, has happened to them. Yeah, a lot of times it depends just on the age of the child. You know, if you do have the teenager who it looks like is isolating when they used to be very, you know, popular. And, you know, if they're no longer doing that, or if, like Nancy said, self-harm is a huge red flag. Um, you know, for the younger kids, it can be, for the little ones, it can be regression in um, bedwetting or, you know, potty training, things like that, um, that you can look out for. Yeah, they've already finished potty training. They were great, and now all of a sudden they're, they're going you back. know, six-year-old is 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 wetting themselves at the school. Why is that happening? And the experts will tell you it's an issue of control. They just want to hold that area. They don't want to touch that area. They don't, you know, they just want to hold on to that control that area until they can't. And so that's something you can look for. Of course, all of this could be something else, and that's the. The difficulty in these cases is you've got to dig deeper, which is why the investigations have to be so thorough. You know, and, and certainly as far as, you know, kids, we and, and that sort of goes to this uh, case that y'all worked, is so many times we tell them when these things happen, right, because we're always focused on the on the parents, on the uh, family members that are doing this, and when something happens, go, go tell your teacher, go tell your priest, go, right. you know, tell these trusted individuals uh, that's who we've told you to turn to. And certainly if it's one of them, talk to your parents. And that, I think that's, that's another struggle, that uh, getting them to come forward and, and feel, like you said, that they can trust someone that's going to believe them. Because I, I believe that's a, a big part is, are you going to believe me over him, right? And most parents, hopefully, will, but they're so scared of that conversation because in part of the grooming, these people tell them, don't tell. Right. They're not going right. to believe you. Uh, this is going to happen to you. That's going to happen to you. Yeah, you're going to be taken away by CPS or, you know, I'm going to be put in jail and, it'll, you know, your mom's going to get deported, something like that where they've scared them into being silent. Sometimes they just silence them with love. Right. So I know I touched on a bunch of things. Was there anything that we didn't cover in the case that y'all want to touch on or on child crimes? I certainly want to give you a voice to, to y'all's uh things that you had on your mind with this you know I, I we've touched on a lot of them uh, you know one of the things that I you know would add was that when we were developing the case and other people were coming forward 
we were having a lot of people come forward and tell us things, right? Everybody had heard so-and-so had been abused at the church. Oh, I think they were always chummy with oh, that guy. Yeah. And they were, they were, you know, and then we, so we hunted down and talked to a lot of people. We divided into teams and we searched out and all the way from Fort Bend County down into Galveston County and Harris County and up here um, and talked to these people because you really just, you can't just You don't assume, want to dismiss it. Right, right, you can't just assume that the rumor is true or that it's false. So we talked to them, um, and many times the rumors had uh, turned into a little bit of the uh, telephone game, right, where it was had ended up being much more uh, was thought to have happened right. than either the, either the person was willing to admit. Uh, some of them flat out denied and said nothing right. had ever happened, right. right? I don't even know what you're talking about. And then right. a lot of the people you talk to, mm -hmm. when you go and talk to them, they're going to say, oh, he was the best guy ever, and we couldn't have had a Hispanic ministry without him. So, of course, you have to turn all that information over to the other side right. sure. um, because you've talked to those witnesses. But it was it was just tracking down and making sure you had an accurate story was really important when we were trying to develop our trial strategy. Um, and in this particular case, I thought one thing that was interesting is you mentioned earlier that they have a preference, and usually that's true. They usually kind of get stuck in that one age group, and we find that most of their victims are in that age group. But we actually had two adult victims that hmm. came forward um, that were um, ab ab abused by La Rosa years later. Um, and so that was just kind of a opportunity, moment of opportunity. Um, so he, he kind of went all over. He didn't have a sexual, like a gender preference. We had boys, we had girls, we had adults, adult women, adult men. So it was really just Across all the over board. the board for him. Which is it is unusual. Very unusual for, yeah. for these kind of cases. Yeah, I think at the end of the day, our, our witness list or list of people that we talked to was well over 100 people. Uh, that we had ended up tracking down. Uh, I, I want to thank our trial team. You know, our investigators, Gail Eccles and Dennis Ward, they had to go find these people. Right. <laughs> and so they spent a lot of time doing that. And then Tempe Calhoun was our records um, management person who helped us organize, you know, tens of thousands of Sounds pages like they were of very documents. busy. Yes, <laughs> yes, we all were. And then also, um, so she was she was instrumental in that. And then lastly, um, Ilda Rupert is our victim coordinator. Yep. And as you can imagine, with all of the the press on this case and everything that was going on in the media, Ilda spent a lot of time updating our victims, um, making sure that they're aware of the process and that nothing unexpected happens. Uh, we really did have a great team on this case, and you know we. We left no stone unturned. Yeah. yeah. Well, y'all have a great team at the DA's office. I brag about y'all all the time uh, and the work that y'all do there and, and supporting, uh, and I should just say working with uh, law enforcement. And, and it's a great team effort between law enforcement and the DA's office. And I think it's what's led to some very strong convictions and some very harsh penalties to get some people just like this off the street and, and stop harming our, our children and other people uh, that are out there. So, and some really smart jurors too. Yes, yes. Uh, I said y'all, uh, y'all put in a big red bow in front of them, and and they're smart enough to realize what they're looking at and avoid some of the, the, smoke screens that are put up uh, in front of it. So, but I appreciate y'all coming in today, and I appreciate everybody listening. Uh, if there's a topic you'd like to hear on the show, if you want to be on the show, if you're a subject matter expert that'd like to discuss one of your cases or a topic. Uh, if you want to sponsor the show, please reach out to me, dan at crimescenetoday.com. And as always, thank I, our Lone Star Radio for hosting and taking care of all the background work to make this available to you. And we'll see you next week.